My name is Dr. Nazim Gowry. I'm a consultant diabetologist at Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, and I'm here to talk to you about diabetes emergencies and their management. Uh, the aims and objectives of uh, this session are to describe the emergencies and acute complications of diabetes and their management and prevention. Uh, they will focus on two main areas. One is hyperglycemia or high blood sugars and those emergencies and situations leading to hypoglycemia or low blood sugars. In relation to uh, hyperglycemia, there are two main emergencies that we'll be covering. One is DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis and the second is HHS otherwise known as hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, or sometimes the reverse hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state. It was formerly known as HONK for those who might be familiar with this older term. And also uh, we'll be talking about hypoglycemia. Diabetic ketoacidosis is common. Uh, often the pathophysiology can be quite difficult and tricky to understand, uh, but it's more important uh, to do the treatment which is actually very simple and important that you do it well so that the patient gets better and we don't result in any complications and the cause of a diabetic uh, uh, or the cause of diabetic ketoacidosis is important because this will help us understand why the patient went into it and hopefully prevent it happening again and then the final point obviously is that prevention is more important than clever analysis and the reason i say that is sometimes you can get a bit fixated with all the numbers resulting to uh, the patient when they initially present in relation to diabetic ketoacidosis, it's a clinical diagnos diagnosis with diagnostic criteria um, and the diagnostic criteria are biochemical. Mainly in type 1 diabetes, but we do recognise there uh, and is something called ketosis prone type 2 diabetes mellitus. We roughly get around 5 to 8 episodes per 1000 people with diabetes and it's interesting to see that the mortality in the UK has improved significantly. Uh, and is less than 1%, but worldwide this can be actually 5%. And this is by and large due to us having standardised protocols in various hospitals. Uh, cerebral edema or increased fluid in the brain is the most common cause of mortality. But things such as hypokalemia or low potassium levels in the blood, ARDS or um, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, AMI or acute myocardial infarction, or infarction uh, pneumonia infections are also other important things to be aware of. In relation to what happens to patients, uh, with diabetes uh, when the sugar levels start to rise it's important to understand that it's all to do with the presence or absence of insulin. In, ab uh, in absolute deficiency of insulin, so when the body has no insulin, so for example someone with type 1 diabetes who has not taken their insulin for a period of time or a newly, or a newly presenting uh, patient with type 1 diabetes, uh, the absence of insulin results in the breakdown of adipose or fat tissue. This results in free at, uh, fatty acids entering the blood um, and uh, these uh, uh, acids are then converted uh, into ketones uh, which uh, are acidic. This reduces the alkaline buffer and you get the acidosis, you get the ketoacidosis uh, and the diabetic ketoacidosis because the sugars are high. So the important thing to realise in type 1 diabetes is it's an absolute deficiency of insulin. However, in uh, poorly controlled type 2 diabetes or in newly presenting type 2 diabetes where sugars levels have got quite high, there's still a little bit of insulin in the system and this prevents the um, free fatty acid production and, the, and a major acidosis that is driven. What happens is muscle is primarily broken down uh, and this results in amino acids uh, being released into the, the blood, the centre of the liver and uh, through the gluconeogenesis pathway these are converted to alternative energy substrates uh, which can result um, in energy being utilised uh, and uh, as a result of this what happens is you get dehydration. Uh, you actually get dehydration in both aspects because you get glucose coming out in the urine, but in type 2 diabetes, the sugar levels can get quite high because of these alternative pathways contributing to the increased sugar in the blood which aren't fully being utilised. So in the former, you get DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis, and in the latter, when there is a little bit of insulin, you get HHS or hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state. Again, just to depict the uh, pathophysiology in, a, uh, in another way, uh, in, in short, we have an absolute or relative deficiency of insulin, we have increased uh, release of other stress hormones like adrenaline and noradrenaline uh, and this results in the increased fat breakdown in the free fatty acids and ketogenesis in type 1 diabetes and uh, in the gluconeogenesis pathway and severe hyperglycemia in the type 2 pathway. 
So the important thing to understand, specifically in type 1 diabetes, is that insulin acts like a key to take sugar into the fat and muscle cells. And in the absence of this key, the, behave, the body behaves as if it's being starved of glucose, creates these alternative pathways or, or generates these alternative pathways, which only exacerbates the situation because the glucose itself is still not being utilized and this is, uh, contributes to dehydration. In terms of blood ketones, blood ketones are far more accurate than urinary ketones. Why? Because blood ketones give you a real-time picture of uh, the ketotic state, whereas urinary ketones are a reflection of what's in the urine. So what's happened is the ketones from the blood have entered the urine and have accumulated in the bladder. So the, the accuracy or the, how fresh these ketones are are only as fresh as uh, the, the urine in the bladder. So if someone has not passed urine for 10 hours, for example, overnight, and they pass in the morning, we don't know whether those ketones were generated in the first part, the middle, or the latter part of the night. Uh, so that's why urinary ketones, although useful, are not as uh, accurate as and as important as blood ketones. And this uh, pathway, which you find in uh, the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, is um, uh, an example of how we use the different cutoff thresholds and how we manage the blood sugars accordingly. So basically, a, an individual who has high blood sugars gets their blood ketone levels checked, and based on the level of ketosis, will determine whether they get. Uh, 5 or 10 or 20 percent of insulin in a bolus uh, to help bring the sugars down and this is important for patients with type 1 diabetes because these patients also have sick day rules which are way home with them which they will follow and are very similar to what we have here so they'll be told to take a percentage of their total daily insulin in the form of short acting insulin depending on the level of ketosis when they have high blood sugars an important other aspect with things uh, in relation to all of this is that they should be drinking fluid regularly to avoid the dehydration aspect to it in terms of all the clinical features of diabetic ketoacidosis, as mentioned, you'll get the osmotic symptoms from the high blood sugars uh, uh, causing uh, the glucose to come out in the urine and taking fluid with it. You get weight loss because of the breakdown of fat and also a bit of muscle. You get the cosmal respiration or a breathlessness sensation. Why? Because of the acidosis or the metabolic acidosis driving uh, the hyperventilation to help blow off the um uh, the uh, the carbon dioxide and removed reduce the acidity in the blood you get abdominal pains specifically in children again this is a direct effect of the ketones you get leg cramps uh, because of all the electrolyte imbalances that take place you get nausea and vomiting again the ketones can drive us to confusion again why because the body can behave as if it's being starved of glucose even though uh, uh, the uh, glucose levels are adequate and you get all these other hormones causing other uh, uh, metabolites to build up in the blood which can affect uh, one's function. Also the significant dehydration can affect uh, uh, confusion levels. In terms of precipitating factors, I touched on this earlier but to kind of give you a better idea of things, we have uh, most commonly, um, there's probably three main areas that we focus on, infections, uh, and these are like your pneumonias, uh, uh, skin infections, which have you know, gone unchecked, urinary tract infections, omission of insulin. So for whatever reason, a patient with known diabetes, type 1 diabetes, is not taking or has not taken their insulin. New onset diabetes. So these are new, newly presenting patients with type 1 diabetes. And in a small minority, you do uh, get patients who present with a non-infection acute illness, such as a myocardial infarction, severe trauma, like a road traffic accident, or pancreatitis, where the pancreas becomes inflamed. And what happens is, although this patient may not be a type 1 diabetic, because the pancreas stops making insulin transiently, uh, you get all the features of somebody like a newly presenting type 1 diabetic. Uh, in terms of physiological precipitants, um, again, I mentioned trauma uh, because of all the hormones that can be released uh, that help uh, in a flight, fight, fright response. Surgery, so if somebody's undergoing surgery again, getting this hormonal uh, release. Pregnancy, what, uh, because the impact of ketosis being, uh, or you get a lower threshold for ketosis in pregnancy, so sugars don't have to be as high for ketosis to ensue. Uh, medications such as steroids, so if you know steroids can push sugars up, and this is primarily due to the effect of the body being resistant to the effect of insulin. So if somebody is injecting insulin and then takes steroids, very high doses of steroids, then unless they're taking more insulin, the, bo the body sugar levels rise because the insulin is not having the desired or full effect as it did before. Failure of an insulin pump. So in an insulin pump, we have a scenario where there's no long-acting insulin in, in the body. It's all, 
all the insulin is in the form of short acting insulin that was delivered in the form of basal rates and um, boluses. So if the pump fails for more than a couple of hours and there's no insulin in the, in the system and therefore the sugars can rise with unopposed uh, insulin to, uh, to switch off or regulate the ketosis. Uh, all the above are also applicable to, to hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, um, although patients with type 2 diabetes will not be on an insulin pump. Uh, but usually precipitates take a bit longer to cause a metabolic upset. So whilst DKA might uh, uh, result um, be a result of only a couple of days of uh, of illness or not taking insulin and the like, with hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, this may even be well over a week before patients present unwell. Something to be aware of, particular relevance uh, to those uh, who work in the mental health uh, sector are psychosocial precipitants of ketoacidosis. So for example, uh, accidental omission of insulin. So if just somebody has cognitive impairment, so you've got somebody who either has an acute uh, confusional state, or they've got something like uh, a condition like dementia, and they've got type one diabetes and it's progressed. It's important that nursing staff are aware of these patients uh, and their pre-existing medical conditions, such as type one diabetes, so that insulin isn't inadvertently missed. Substance abuse, again, either through causing a kind of an altered mental state or a psychosis, but also uh, some of these substances used can drive uh, these uh, adrenaline or adrenaline responses, which can have anti-insulin effects. Deliberate omission of insulin. So for example, those who have uh, eating disorders trying to manage their weight, uh, those who have significant phobia of hypoglycemia, because they know that if you don't take insulin, they won't get low blood sugars. If they're trying to escape a domestic situation, so for example, if they're struggling at home, uh, if they miss their insulin, they know that, for example, that they can get into hospital and get out of the situation that they're in. Depression, either because of lack of volition uh, associated with the depressive symptoms or potentially as a way of trying to uh, take their life uh, in quite severe scenario uh, cases. Uh, attention seeking behavior, again, this might be uh, might manifest a lot in teenagers or in those who are in situations where they're not getting the attention they were getting before from the people around them. Uh, and then obviously a specific more uh, uh, eating disorders, than, uh, but I had touched upon this earlier. In terms of diagnosing diabetic ketoacidosis, um, uh, you need a clinical scenario of a, a patient having high blood sugars uh, with biochemical criteria also met. And these are focusing on the needing of three specifics. These are high blood sugars, uh, such as a, usually like a blood sugar of over 11 or known diabetes, uh, ketonemia or, incre or, or, blood, uh, or increased blood ketone levels, uh, and that's uh, more than three millimoles per liter on their finger prick or on uh, the ketone meter that you uh, may have access to. Blood ketones of more than two pluses in the urine. And then finally, the acidosis. So that means having a, a bicarbonate of less than 18. Now, bicarbonate is the buffer uh, for... Uh, acids in the blood. So if the bicarbonate level is low, this is a reflection of increased buffering activity because of increased acidity in the blood. Or uh, a pH of less than 7.3 or hydrogen ions of more than 45 nanomoles uh, per litre. So basically you need to have all three to have a diagnosis of diabetic ketoacidosis. So for example, somebody may have a blood glucose of 28, uh, uh, ketones of three pluses in the urine, a bicarbonate of seven, for example. Uh, and sometimes you may get patients who present with uh, ketoacidosis, um, but with slightly lower blood sugars, and these can often be in scenarios where patients uh, are, pr are pregnant. So uh, if you've got uh, ladies, for example, in, who are in the uh, kind of prenatal stage uh, and are being monitored uh, a bit more um, intensively, uh, you might come across ladies uh, with, um, with perhaps not as high blood sugars, but certainly having the ketoacidosis aspects. And as mentioned before, uh, we have the ketosis because of uh, the switch to free fatty acid metabolism due to an absolute deficiency of insulin. You can get ketosis in a relative deficiency of insulin, but it's not as high as that, but certainly can be there in the earlier stages, uh, uh, which lead up to diabetic ketoacidosis. And uh, in terms of the actual acid, uh, acidosis itself, uh, we have 3-beta-hydroxybutyric acid and aceto -ac uh, uh, acetic acid as the two main uh, ketones that are converted to acids and the, for and the former is converted into the, the latter. And uh, the urine measures the latter. 
In terms of typical losses, uh, de- as I mentioned, dehydration is a, is a major feature and potentially individuals can lose six to eight litres of water. Uh, they'll lose a fair bit of salt with that, so sodium and chloride. Potassium levels are also depleted, but sometimes you may see a slightly higher blood potassium level, and that is to help buffer the hydrogen ions or the acidosis in the blood. So what happens is the hydrogen ions enter the cells to keep the blood less acidic, and as a result, the potassium levels come out, but the overall net potassium uh, levels in the blood are down. You can also use tra- lose trace elements such as calcium, phosphate, and magnesium. And a simple way to remember things is that usually patients will lose about 100 ml per kilogram of body weight and around 3 to 5 millimoles of potassium per kilogram of body weight. In terms of treatment of diabetic ketoacidosis, and although I accept that not much of this treatment will be um, initiated in maybe a mental health setting, but it's nonetheless worth being aware of, uh, specifically if uh, you are accompanying patients to the acute hospital. Uh, and the, fir- the first thing is to really restore fluid uh, um, um, and this helps rest- restoration of circulating volume. We tend to use crystalloids such as uh, saline uh, uh, as a fluid of choice. This also helps clear the ketones from the blood by improving the circulation and getting uh, and helping the urinary excretion of things. We add in dextrose uh, during treatment uh, to, uh, to the fluids, particularly if uh, the sugar levels have dropped but ketones haven't cleared to allow us to keep the insulin going. Um, and uh, fluid also helps correct the electrolyte imbalance because sodium chloride, as I mentioned, sodium chloride are two major electrolytes depleted and we often add potassium to these bags as well once the initial stages have passed. Insulin helps suppress ketogenesis, and we've touched on this earlier, helps lower blood sugar levels by helping taking glucose into the fat and muscle cells, and also it helps correct the electrolyte imbalance. And this is done uh, by the effect that insulin has on potassium. So when insulin is uh, present, it causes not only glucose, but potassium to enter cells. So glucose and potassium enter cells together, which is why it's important we monitor potassium levels and be aware that potassium levels can fall as the sugar levels start dropping because the insulin is causing this to happen. We should always understand, uh, uh, consider and treat the precipitating cause, for example, any infections in the form of antibiotics, for example, um, and generally we try and maintain a potassium level between 4 and 5 millimoles per litre. In terms of thinking outside the box, it's important to understand that with DKA, or diabetic ketoacidosis, we have the hyperglycemia for the D, the ketosis for the K, and the acidosis for the A, but there might be other reasons why the D, the K, and the A uh, may be occurring. Uh, and it's important to understand that th- there may be other conditions coexisting uh, with the diabetic ketoacidosis, or maybe uh, causing you to get a very similar type of biochemical picture, but the patient is in true diabetic ketoacidosis. And I think the main thing is to highlight with this is uh, the lactic acidosis that can occur with an infection. So for example, if you have a low bicarbonate and the ketone levels aren't particularly high at that point in time, uh, then it, it could be that uh, it's an infection that they've got, but if left unchecked, then yes, ketoacidosis can manifest itself. And also we have alcoholic ketosis uh, and starvation ketosis which are probably relevant to uh, those working in a mental health environment because uh, this can lower the threshold. Um, You can have patients who have a a ketoacidosis but their sugar levels may not be particularly high. uh, But nonetheless, because they have significant ketoacidosis, they might still need insulin if they've got pre-existing type 1 diabetes to help control things. This is the chart that is used in the acute hospital that, that, uh, in, in the acute hospital throughout Scotland. It's a standardized chart in terms of how we assess the patient to ensure that we've got the right diagnosis and make sure we get the initial management but also continuing management correct. And this is one of the reasons why mortality is actually much lower now because we have these standardized charts so all healthcare staff involved with looking after patients with type 1 diabetes have a familiar familiarity with things and also because of the checkbox uh, aspect of things it's unlikely things will get missed. An important thing to understand with this is that we have an immediate or initial 0 to 60 minute management, then a 1 to 4 hour management, and then uh, a beyond 4 hour management, uh, which is in pathway 2. And again, you might find that these patients will not be started on this when they're in a mental health environment, but where there are liaison services or where uh, individuals need to be accompanied uh, from the psychiatric hospital, it's worth being aware of things uh, so that you understand uh, what's going on. In terms of hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, uh, although some prefer to call it hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state because primarily it's a glucose disorder, 
we again have the hypovolemia because of diosmotic diuresis from the high blood sugars. But the interesting thing is that in hyperosmo um, HHS is that the blood glucose levels can actually be higher than in DKA. The reason for this is that it's things have developed over a prolonged period of time and often these individuals do not have blood sugar meters to monitor the sugar levels so things can uh, get quite significant before they actually get assessed by a healthcare practitioner. Uh, in terms of the hyperosmolality, uh, uh, this is can be crudely calculated by uh, taking the sodium and the potassium levels, uh, adding to the other, multiplying them by two, adding the urea and the glucose. And usually the osmolality is more than 320, but often over 330 uh, to, to, to tick that box. The bicarbonate can be low, so low is usually anything under Okay, 1918, but it's not as low as uh, what we'd one find in DKA, such as in single figures. Uh, and you'll get the absence of significant ketones. So again, you might get one plus in the uh, in the urine, you might get one, uh, one millimole per liter on the blood ketone levels, but again, not as high as the DKA levels. So although it might be perceived that DKA is more serious than HHS purely based on the fact that we see more of DK than HHS in hospital uh, and that's by virtue of the fact that only 1% of diabetes related admissions annually are due to HHS, the mortality rates are much higher. That's primarily because the, uh, the um, uh, HHS presents in older individuals who may have other comorbidities and already have a higher risk of uh, hospital related death. Uh, and the fact that it can be an insidious onset, meaning it could potentially be one or two weeks uh, uh, in, at home and or not being in an acute environment, becoming more and more unwell and have a significant metabolic decompensation before they're actually picked up. And uh, infection uh, is, a, is, a, is a main trigger to all, but uh, other factors such as poor compliance and heart attacks uh, can uh, exacerbate uh, an HHS picture. In terms of treatment, as with uh, in diabetic ketoacidosis, um, fluid and insulin are key to things. But the important thing to understand with the fluid treatment and uh, insulin treatment uh, in HHS is that generally there are about half the rates that are used for DKA. And again, this is because the onset was more gradual. The treatment should also be a bit more gentle. Otherwise, potentially you're under risk of causing significant fluid shifts and potentially things such as cerebral edema, cerebral edema which can uh, which are associated with significant uh, morbidity and mortality. Treating the precipitant goes without saying, but also because of a significant dehydration component uh, and re often reduced mobility in these individuals, low molecular heparin to reduce the risk of VTE and adequate foot protection to uh, minimize the risk of uh, development of foot ulcers are also key to management. Uh, moving on to hypoglycemia, uh, in diabetes patients, we tend to have a higher threshold uh, for using uh, for diagnosing hypoglycemia in terms of blood glucose levels. So in diabetes patients on sulfonylureas or, in, uh, or on insulin, we go for a blood glucose value of four or less. The reason for this is that these treatments uh, have a glucose lowering effect regardless of what the actual blood sugar level is. So even if your, if your blood sugar is 14 or your blood sugar is four, if you have these drugs in the system, they'll continue to lower the blood sugar uh, and their effects will not uh, in itself be waned. You will get counter-regulated processes in place such as glucagon release and uh, adrenaline noradrenal to help fight it, but the effect of these drugs uh, in and of themselves will not uh, reduce. Uh, and therefore having a blood glucose level of four as a cutoff means that individuals have enough time to, uh, uh, to have symptoms which can be identified and picked up on and treated responsibly and independently before they run into trouble. Uh, because a biochemical definition of, of hypoglycemia in someone without diabetes is actually around 2.8 uh, or in the twos. But in this scenario, we don't have um, um, insulin that's been injected or tablets that are going to continually, continuously cause the sugars to be lowered. And therefore, uh, the, thre uh, the threshold is lower. Uh, a Whipple's triad is, is a physiological term you may have come across in nursing school where it is associated with low blood sugar, symptoms of low blood glucose, and the symptoms reversed with taking carbohydrate. Hypoglycemia is very important because uh, uh, from one study from about 12 years ago, 12, 13 years ago, it demonstrated that admissions are around 7.5% uh, or so, so more common than the HHS we saw on, the, on, on our previous slide. The length of stay in hospitals increased by about two and a half days, 
your mortality as an inpatient in that admission goes up threefold and your mortality at one year is actually two twice as more likely compared to someone who did not have hypoglycemia a year before. So hypoglycemia has major implications, not just in the immediate uh, hospital stay, but also down the line. Again, a nice fancy diagram to confuse you all. And this is just to highlight uh, what happens in the presence of low blood sugars, uh, uh, or what happens when you have low blood sugars in the blood. Uh, and in somebody who uh, has a normally functioning pancreas, what would happen is the insulin levels would go down, the own uh, insulin levels that are being made, or, or, or the own insulin uh, that's being produced, uh, would the, these levels would go down. As I mentioned, some of the type 1 diabetes, because their pancreas is not making insulin, you have the injected insulin, and you don't have this aspect of autoregulation. Glucagon levels go up, and you have the increased uh, um, stress hormone release as well, all in all, uh, these uh, counter-regulation mechanisms are there to help raise the blood sugar levels, getting more blood uh, uh, sugar from the liver uh, to help uh, restore blood glucose to a normal level. In terms of symptoms of uh, low blood sugar, they occur in a, in a, in a, in a graded or gradual manner. Um, um, so in terms of the physiology of what happens in the body and also the symptoms that a person gets, if the pancreas is functioning normally, then you'd actually get the inhibition of insulin release. Um, uh, but in terms of symptoms, uh, you might start feeling just a bit unwell, a bit headachy, nauseated. Then as the sugars fall under four, uh, because of these counter-regulatory hormones, such as glucagon and adrenaline, uh, you, you, you start to get sweating, palpitations, shaking, nausea, anxiety, hunger. And these are the symptoms you're trying to capture in somebody with diabetes on insulin when the sugars are less enforced. So when they start getting these symptoms to check their blood sugar and act accordingly. Uh, but it's interesting to note as well that even individuals who do have a blood sugar level uh, in the threes uh, may not get any symptoms. As the sugar levels fall under three into the twos, then that's when you get impairment of cognitive function and concentration and ability to perform complex tasks, confusion, drowsiness. And as you can see with these symptoms, it would be very difficult for an individual to manage their low blood sugar independently. The chances are they'll need help from someone else. And also, they're getting very clo um, close to the threshold of having a, sh uh, of a sugar level, which may result in significant uh, danger to that individual in the form of seizures or coma. Uh, so hopefully by understanding that the symptoms of hypoglycemia are varied and, and take... Uh, and uh, depending on the blood sugar level, but also can be a, a range of symptoms, individuals uh, will start thinking of low blood sugar in a patient who starts behaving a bit differently compared to how they were uh, when their sugars were normal. In terms of causes of low blood sugar, uh, um, the diabetes medications, I mentioned insulin or certain um, 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 and sulfonylureas are, are key, but also if you're on other medication with insulin, although these drugs in and itself will not cause low blood sugars, will certainly potentially increase the risk of a low blood sugar. Alcohol can cause low blood sugar. This is why you actually get the ketosis production because it switches off the glucose production in the liver and that's why the ketones form. So this is a scenario where you can have low blood sugars and ketosis. Critical illness, so for example, liver failure, so the liver's not able to churn out the glucose levels. Um, chronic renal failure uh, as well. And again, chronic renal failure can, in the context of insulin, can worsen hypoglycemia because the insulin is not being excreted from the urine and it remains in the system causing a prolonged effect. Uh, sepsis uh, is, is a key feature as well. Uh, another thing to be aware of is when you have hormone deficiency, for example, Addison's disease or when someone is on a steroid replacement and have not taken their steroid tablets. Uh, and this is very, very important because what happens is in the same way that too much steroid can make your sugars go up. If you have no steroid, then there'll be increased uh, activity of insulin to cause the sugars to go down. Uh, starvation or anorexia nervosa. Uh, again, specifically in those patients who are taking insulin or sulfonylurea tablets because they're not eating and then you have unopposed activity of these drugs. Creon are digestive enzymes taken in a capsule form in patients who have uh, pancreatic dysfunction or chronic pancreatitis. So although the pancreas makes insulin as part of its um, uh, endocrine uh, hormone production, uh, it also makes uh, digestive enzymes as part of exocrine function. And if someone's either had their pancreas removed or had chronic alcohol problems which have damaged the pancreas, they need to take creon as well to help digest and absorb the food that they eat. So if somebody has, for example, taken their insulin 
and has eaten but not taken their creon, then they will not actually be able to benefit from the nutrition from their food and therefore their, the sugars can dip. The general rule is in these individuals who have problems with their pancreas and are on insulin as well, we say they should take the creon, eat their food and then take their insulin after and that's the safest way to ensure that they don't have hypoglycemia. And again, if somebody has taken insulin or had their sulfonylurea tablets but vomited, apologies for the typo in that, um, uh, on, this, uh, on that slide, uh, they will uh, potentially have a low blood sugar level because again there's no sugar for the insulin to work on. And the severity of the autonomic symptoms are classed as mild, moderate or severe. So, so are severe. Milder than just have the autonomic symptoms. Moderate when you have a mixture of autonomic and ne neuroglycopenic symptoms. And severe when again you have um, all the symptoms but obviously the cognition and is, is, very, is very, very impaired and they're pretty much are going into coma. The treatment of hypoglycemia will depend on the severity and your access to carbohydrate and the patient's ability to uh, follow uh, the, the treatment algorithm. Um, in the simplest form, taking oral carb a quick acting carbohydrate in the form of, for example, Coke, as in Coca-Cola, because it's sadly, because of the sugar tax, uh, a lot of the other sugar, um, sugar drinks have had the sugar contents halved. So uh, whatever they take in these drinks will have to be double in terms of volume to get the same sugar impact. Uh, so Coca-Cola and Pepsi are okay. Iron brew is not sadly. Um, fruit juice, so natural fruit juice actually has a lot of sugar in it uh, as a good alternative. Uh, or sugar uh, in the form of either glucose cubes or glucose tablets or sugar mixed in water. These are all oral routes which should be utilized first if the patient is able to use that route and is conscious enough to, uh, to drink safely. If they are not able to or you don't have access to it, then use of intravenous glucose is, is an option. Uh, and in absence of that, using glucagon uh, intramuscularly is something that we, we do use and glucagon helps get the, luger, the sort of liver to uh, secrete sugar to help fight the initial um, uh, reduction in blood sugar level. However, if you do not replenish glucose stores after giving IM glucagon, then there's a risk of hypoglycemia down the line. And that's why that aspect of long-acting carbohydrate, if necessary, depending on when their next meal is, when they last ate, etc. And always check StaffNet and the latest GGNC therapeutic handbook for management of hypoglycemia. Just in short, this is how things generally look. You have a traffic light type system uh, based on the mild, moderate and sever uh, severity of the, uh, um, of the hypoglycemia and how we would manage this. Important thing as well is do not think about omitting the next insulin dose just because someone had a low blood sugar because this can result in trouble down the line. So always seek advice from somebody who is more familiar with the patient, understands diabetes. Uh, rather than just omitting insulin because the last thing you want to do is go from a low blood sugar to high blood sugar and potentially diabetic ketoacidosis particularly if your next insulin injection is a very long acting insulin. Just to summarize acute complications of hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia are easy to pick up uh, on if you're familiar with the clinical presentation, precipitants and how to diagnose. Uh, acute complications of hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia are straightforward to manage uh, if you're familiar with the protocols. Uh, and finally, acute complications of hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia are life-threatening if left untreated.